Okay. Uh, yes, yes, y'all. Welcome to uh, Coffee with the Founder. I got my coffee cup here. And today I got my good friend and uh, colleague, homeboy, for sure, Bryant K. Smith here with us today. Bryant, now what we're trying to do with this uh, interview is to really give people insight to the people who've been supporting the conference, attending the conference, a part of the conference. That's so right. Most times they see you present or see you do something from the stage, they don't really get to know what you do, how you do what you do, how you came about. And that's really what we're trying to do with this. So uh, imagine I meet you at, you know, um, a, a store or, or a bus <laughs> stop and uh, okay. an airplane, and I don't know you. And I say, who are you? What, what do you do? What's, what's your expertise? How would you explain that? Who is Brian K. Smith? Hey, I say Brian K. Smith is the human potential specialist. My job is to help make good people great and great people become memorable. I do that by running my own comprehensive consulting agency, Smith Consulting and Networking. I've been doing it for the last 15 years. I help businesses and schools invest in their most valuable assets. That's their people. I deal with issues around leadership, diversity, and equity. And I do that as well as my special focus on black males. So that's what I do in a nutshell. That's what I would tell them. And then I start talking to them about what can I help you with. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to go, I want to talk a little bit more about some of that other store, other, some of those other things you're doing, but you mentioned black males. Uh, yes, I'm, sir. Uh, what is your sense of the state of the black man, the black male in today's society, 2020? You know, um, this is coming up on me working 15 years in this industry. And the majority of that time, I've been doing a lot of uh, diversity and equity and inclusion, social justice work. And the majority of it has been spent around dealing with issues around black males. And the thing that I have come to for this year, which is really, really, really reaffirmed the fact that I'm gonna go back into uh, picking up the black male workshops and space a little more is the fact that we have gone from being invisible as black men to being erased as black men. And that's a heck of a difference and a heck of a distinction. When you think about invisible life and Ralph Ellison talking about here I am that people just don't see me to now you see me but you're actively trying to erase me that's a big difference and mm. so that's that's what I think that our status is we are in jeopardy of being erased mm. Mm. yeah yeah so um when you talk about the work you do around black males um, and going back to doing more of that, what is that work? I mean, if a school brings you in, I bring you in to an organization, Black Males there, right? in a day, two days, three days. I mean, what is the work that you're doing? Yeah, well, when you bring me in, of course, we talk about how white supremacy and white privilege impacts Black males. So that's, what, that's if you were bringing me in. If the average college or university were bringing me in, one of the problems that we've had is that they want to change the discussion. They don't want to talk about black males anymore. They want to talk about men of color. And they want us all to have the same issues and the same problem and the same solution. And that's a shift. As if black males have arrived, that we've uh, finally gotten to, through the academy and we've reached such a level that we don't have some individual and very specific needs. So most people want me to come in and they think that I'm going to do some food folks and fun. I'm going to teach you how to tie a tie. I'm going to teach you how to say, yes, sir, no, sir, pull your pants up. And that's not what I do. My job is to help you go from being a male into being a man, and not just any man, but a black man. So we understand and start trying to define what that means to be a black man, how you move as a black man, how you go through that institution as a black man, and be unapologetic about the fact that you're black, and then that you walk across the stage a black man safe and sane in your identity as a black man so that you can provide a service to your black community. That's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I have to ask you a difficult question around defining yeah. black male that relates to LGBTQ. Yes, go ahead. You know, I think that as I've been doing the work over the last 25 years in my personal development and um, being raised in a Southern Baptist kind of culture, I, right. I, I think I can say that it was a narrow, limited experience. Oh, yeah. So as I'm thinking about how to define black male, being a black man in 2020, 
uh, I'm thinking about the expansiveness, the intersectionality. I mean, what are some of the issues you faced around uh, what it means to be a black male, but as other issues of intersectionality from you know race, gender, but right. primarily sexual orientation, sexual, sexual identity. Orientation. Well, most of the time, the, the problem is that the people who are bringing me in have a very narrow perspective around black manhood. And so one of the first things I want to do is I take your genitalia out the picture. I don't care what's happening below your waist. I'm more interested in what's happening above your neck. So we got to deal with your mind. I'm worried about the mentality of a black man. I don't care who you sleeping with. Because the way I was raised, if you really are a black man, nobody knows who you sleeping with anyway. That's not even part of our discussion. Who you sleeping with shouldn't determine your politics. It shouldn't determine your value system. It shouldn't determine uh, your religious practices. So we don't even have to spend a whole lot of time on that. What I need to talk about is, like you said, those intersections, the things that all black men are going to have in common particularly when we're out here dealing with white privilege and white supremacy. When we're out here trying to matriculate through these predominantly white institutions, there are a series of barriers that are systematically in place that are going to either help or hinder your progress. And that's what we need to be dealing with. I need to prepare you to deal with those things. And a lot of that don't have a whole lot to do with who you're sleeping with. Yeah, I, I like that. Not waist down, but shoulders up. Um, yes. I, I appreciate that. Well, you mentioned, which is something that we do at the White Privilege Conference, white supremacy, white privilege, other forms of oppression. Um, uh, what are some of the particular challenges of black males, black men, black boys, as it relates to white supremacy, white uh, cultural dominance, white privilege, so on and so forth? Oh, well, it's, it's simple things. Simple things like when you grow and you walk a certain way, talk a certain way, all of a sudden, there's a double standard. So for instance, if I stand up in a classroom and say, hey, well, I'm not sure that that's an accurate representation of black men that we just saw in that film, and I'd like to offer a different viewpoint. If the professor or my fellow students are intimidated by me, then, oh, well, Brian, you're, you're aggressive. Or if I'm in my staff meeting and I'm talking to my colleagues about who we should bring for a student activity or a student program or a concert, and I'm making suggestions, oh, oh well, Brian, you're always aggressive. But if my white counterpart makes the same comment, advocating for who they want, they're just being assertive. You see? So, so we got to deal with this double standard. We got to deal with the fact that even in 2020, the majority of people have had such a segregated experience that I might be the first black person that they meet on a college campus. So we're still dealing with those type of things. And the only thing that they know about me in 2020 is what they've seen on television or film or music videos and YouTube and TikTok and all these other social media outlets. And most of that is going to be pretty crazy and negative. Mm. Um, I just got to ask you about the Surgeon General. I just got to. So because I think I can get a genuine response from you because I'm grappling with this. Because Naeem Akbar taught me years ago, I love black people. No matter what diversity they bring, what challenge they bring, I love black people. Yes. And so I'm wondering what kind of responses are you hearing in reference to uh, Surgeon General, uh, is it Adams or Abrams, I think? Um, uh, but it does, what, doesn't matter if it's. Abrams, Adams, Tom, Thomas. Well, I mean, what do you want to do? No matter what you call I'm just, it. I'm just wondering what kind of, in the circle you are, what kind of response, or e even you personally, as what seems to be an intent to do something good that causes so much damage. Right. Um, it, they, also, they I think about black male at the highest level of white cultural yeah. dominance, predominantly white institutions, is there a toll? Should we be offering some grace, some space? So what's your sense of, I mean, just not him specifically, but even black males at that high level? Okay. At that high level, again, I'm worried about what you are, what's your commitment and connection to the community. So if you're at that high level, and you're still implementing policies that are anti-Black, anti-African, I, I don't care that you physically look Black. 
because mentally and systematically you are operating against the interests of black people as a whole. Now, I think the, the brother made a statement trying to demonstrate some solidarity to the community, which would have been taken as, as oh, that's great. Had he only added the same type of condemnation for the white folks who are walking around without masks and not taking this seriously. But since he just played up the whole, oh, Big Mama said, y'all need to stop smoking and, you know, well, what, what about the white people who are smoking? I went to a Walmart the other day to get my groceries and a white dude was standing outside the Walmart near the line where we supposed to be social distancing to go in, smoking. And all the time in Walmart, they are playing over the intercom, please do not loiter outside of Walmart. But that's all he doing, he's standing there loitering. He could have smoked in his car. Why do you have to stand outside and smoke without a mask? You know, so it's, if, if the brother had just been consistent in critiquing everybody's contributions to uh, failing to adhere to the social distancing policy, I don't think we would have had a problem with it. But the bigger issue is, in order for him to stay on that particular team that he's on, he got to toe the company line. And that's always the dilemma that black men face. How do you toe the company line provide for your family, grow to the highest level of your profession, and still be authentic, authentic in your blackness. Mm. Can you do it? Yeah, What's the, what does that cost? And yeah. I think he's decided that for him, there is a line that he is willing to cross and a line that he's not willing to cross. And so it's, it's, it's real difficult because, you know, everybody black, there is no monolithic black experience but there is a collective experience that's recognized as uniquely black, particularly in America. And so you either part of that or you not. And if you outside of it, the good thing is, like you say, we love everybody. We let OJ back in the community. We let Jesse Smollett back in the community. We gonna let a whole bunch of people back in. That's who we are. So it don't matter that you, you know, again, that your upbringing gave you access to some resources, and, and benefits that some of us didn't have, we still want you to come be a part of the community. But we want you to come and contribute in a positive way. We don't want you doing stuff that's detrimental to us. And that's where we have to draw that line. We have to stop accepting the fact and making passes for people who look like us, but attack us. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's an interesting time as we look at the next 25 years of this work of our society and white supremacy and blackness and black males, as we've seen some success, so to speak, or access, so to speak. And I think your question is, what's gonna, what's, what's the toll it takes? Uh, where, where do we draw the line? And so um, I, I, I'm hoping folks continue to grapple with that question because you got me grappling and i always like grappling with you because i know when i talk to <laughs> brian k i'm gonna get the truth the whole truth and nothing You're but get it. even though we may not agree all the time and i want right. to ask you about that because um i feel like you're one of the few consultants consistently pissing people off when you show up <laughs> i mean that's, that's just the bottom line and i mean uh it's like a professor at the college that nobody wants to take because they know they're going to get the business. Yeah. But 10 years later, they come back and say, thank you, Professor Smith, for assisting me to reach my highest level possible. It's like That's a right. coach, so to speak. That's right. But it takes a toll. I'm wondering, uh, does it take a toll on you when you're presenting oh, or when you're experiencing these kinds of pushbacks and how you take care of yourself in the mix of really being the person that nobody really likes at times right. because you're pushing and challenging at a high level. Right. Well, you know, the business that we're in, you're always torn between giving people what they want and what they need. People will pay for what they want, but your job is also to give them what they need in that process. And so for me, I tell people all the time, I got enough friends. You didn't bring me here to make new friends. You brought me in to make a difference. You brought me in because you were facing some kind of problem that you couldn't handle on your own. So you need somebody to give you a viewpoint. Again, we don't have to agree, but my thing is critical thinking. I come in to give you 
food for critical thought. I give you the tools, I give you the resources, and I'm gonna push you beyond your comfort zone. Because nothing in this world worth having was comfortable. Let's ask your mom. Your birth was not comfortable for her, but look what it brought into the world. Look what it created. You got Eddie Moore Jr. right there. So what good would it do me to show up at your company? You pay me a bunch of money, and I will let you just stay comfortable. If you wanted to be comfortable, you wouldn't have called me. So yes, there's a toll that that takes though, because you, you know, we in this space, We've done research, we've done workshops, we've got, we, you're paying me not only for the one hour that I show up and do the work, but you're paying me for the 50 plus life years of life experience that I have. You're paying me for the degrees that I earned, you're paying me for the research that I've done, the books I've written, written and read. Those all things that come into play. So you, all of a sudden you questioning me, like you're the expert. If you were the expert, you probably would not have brought me in. So yeah, you have to sit there sometimes and every now and then you, you end up, I end up in a space like, man, is it me? Because everybody, come, you know, people come at you in workshops. Everybody wants to be an expert, particularly now that we're in this, this season we're in right now where truth don't matter, honesty don't matter, research don't matter, uh, you know, people don't value college anymore. So everybody can be an expert by watching YouTube and and you know going online and that's it that makes them expert so we deal with that but to to really address your question you can't do this work and be true to it if you worried about people liking you mm. i don't go into any situation saying oh i came here to get enough people to like me today more likes i come in to do good work to live people Better than when I, well, the way that I found them. I want people to have healthy relationships. My discipline is communication. So I'm always worried about two things, messages that I receive and messages that are sent. So I never want to give the wrong message. And giving the wrong message to me also involves a bunch of lies. If I come in there and tell you, oh, we post-racial, <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> you know, I know you would feel better if I said we post-racial. Oh, the virus has brought us all together. That's a lie. <laughs> the virus hasn't brought us closer together. I am convinced the only thing that's going to bring us closer together, particularly racially, is if some aliens from another planet come down here and then all humanity has to get together. And even then, I think if the, if the aliens came, and they did a Twilight Zone episode about this, if the aliens came, we would all unite. But if the aliens said, hey, y'all give us all them black folks and we'll give you the cure to cancer, they would ship our butts off the planet in a minute. So we still haven't found this thing that's going to make us coalesce. I mean, I think it's better than it used to be. Yes, I acknowledge that. But is it where it needs to be? No. Is it where it could be? No. We have a long way to go. So, I, you know, I don't sweat it now. It's, I like music. So after I had one of those workshops or long days where people have just been beating me up or something, I can come in and drop some field collins. I don't care anymore. Mm. What you say? Mm. Never did leave you much anyway. You know how you <laughs> get out of my way. Let me out. <laughs> let me let me ask you about COVID nineteen. You mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, just how you're doing, man, because we joked a little bit before air that we've been confined in a way that we haven't been confined in years. I mean, our life is on the road. So I'm wondering yeah how you're doing, how the family's doing, and what's your sense of how the community is doing where you're living there in the mix of COVID-19? Well, you know, we, we are doing well. Family's doing well. Personally, like you say, my biggest adjustment is, is to being stuck in one place. My life has been on the road for the last 15 years full time. So for me to be sitting in the house uh, this length of time, now that's probably, that's hurting me. But I always had a virtual aspect to my business. I was always, I was doing virtual visits before COVID-19. So there's an ability for me to just kind of roll with the punches and change and adjust my business. The problem is there are two different adjustments that have to be made. One, for us as service providers, we had to get into the technology. But then two, the audience. See, when I was doing virtual visits before, my audience was still in one location. 
So the, the school might just beam me into an auditorium. Now we got to get used to the idea that everybody's in another place and they have competing interests. So it might be 30 people, 50 people, 100 people on a Zoom call, and you're trying to manage that and get the same type of feel as you would on, on stage. So, you know, the, the virus, is, it's, it's had its impact. Of course, business is down. You know, in one day I lost six, the next six months worth of business. You know, and this, now it's trying to rebuild that. How do you get it back? When do people uh, get started? All the conferences are, you know, white privilege is my, one of my favorite conferences. To not be able to go to the white privilege conference, like, you know, that's, that changes my whole spirit, you know, because those are the times where I not only go and present, but I rebuild my relationship with brothers like you. You know, when you start talking about how do you feel, when I go someplace and I can be reaffirmed by other brothers who putting it down, like you, you know, like when you say, well, people bring Eddie Moore Jr. and you show up in the room, everybody ain't happy with that, you know. But when you and I get to sit down and talk about it, oh, yeah, you had that experience too? You know, there's a bond that, that goes with this. So we, you know, it, it, the virus is cool, man. I'm, I think it's going to change the way we do business. It's going to change the way that we live as a society. And, uh, you know, you just have to, like I said, when you're in this business, you ride the waves. This ain't the first recession I didn't, I didn't sat through, so it won't be the last by the time I keep doing this work. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, 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 and talking about keeping going and doing the work, what's, what's on the horizon for you the next 10 years as you think about the next <laughs> decade, uh, the human potential specialist? Well, what's here, on the horizon? Here is, I'm, I'm on my anti-erasure campaign. Everything that I do now is going to be so that people don't erase black males and that they don't erase my work. I worked at five different institutions as a professional, and I was given 15, almost, almost 20 years to working at those five institutions. And the work that I have put there has practically been erased at almost every one of those places. The things that I built, the programs, the relationships, all those things that help primarily black students have been wiped out. So now for the next half many years I got left, my job is to make sure people do not erase black people and the legacy of the work that I'm doing. So I've got, a, I've got this piece called A Black Man that you let me premiere at the White Privilege Conference where we talking about it. When I brought it to White Privilege, there were six different types of black men. They all that A. Based on the feedback I got at the White Privilege Conference, there are now eight black men that start with the letter A. So I'm putting that piece together while I'm locked down in the lab and putting the finishing touches on it. It's going to be a new way to experience uh, black men. It's what I call the black man's vagina monologue. So if you like the vagina monologues, when I get this piece and put it out, you ought to bring it in and, you know, let me come and do this piece. Uh, and there's a virtual version for it. So that's one thing I'm doing. The other thing I'm doing, I'm working on a couple of books. I won't tell you the titles because if I tell you the titles and don't have them out by next week, somebody will be and put it out for me. <laughs> uh, so, but, but there are two new books coming on the horizon. I'm also doing uh, the tour. And I brought the, the, a piece of the G.I. Joe collection to the White Privilege Conference. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do the Toy Story tour because I think that is a message that needs to be shared. One, about Black military participation. But two, the story of how hard it is to find positive black toys and black role models in that. Again, you know, my discipline is communication. So I care about the message. So I'm doing the, the tour and getting some sponsors lined up so that I can go and bring those action figures and their history to schools that probably wouldn't be able to afford me any other way. So if somebody out there wants to sponsor a great exhibit, Toy Story, the little known fact of how G.I. Joe played a role in the civil rights movement and demonstrating black military participation in every conflict that we've had. So those are the things I'm doing. And now, the thing that I'm probably the most excited about because being locked in my house has given me more time to work on it, I'm doing some coaching. -y. I have me a couple of coaching clients. Now, some of them I've been working with and I've been doing basic life coach. But now I'm in the speaking coach. I'm building the next generation of speakers. And I got a sister I'm just, I ain't going to tell you a real name, but we call her Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim is an anesthesiologist. She's a bad sister. And when I get through with this training, she's going to light up the speaking world. And I'm talking about put it on fire. So those, those are things I'm, I'm gearing up for for the next 10 years. 
uh, if I have to sit at home, I ain't gonna be sitting here doing nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, um, um, I definitely have some interest in the GI Joe uh, possible collaboration, partnership, sponsorship. So we gotta talk a little bit talk. more about that. But okay. just tell people a little bit about that, man, because I think when you say GI Joe, one, it seems so far, 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 far away. <laughs> Two, there doesn't seem to be any black folks connected to that at all. But right. I think does there or is there still today a pretty white portrayal of toys? Because some people would argue it's changed a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's it's the same thing. If it changed so much, then when I show up with the exhibit, why are people still saying to me, I didn't know they made black G.I. Joes? And we're talking about G.I. Joe, the action figures. First made in 1965. G.I. Joe was a white action figure based on the World War II soldier because they was done, brought in and created that way to do two things. One, overcome primarily white males' objections to buying their sons a doll. So they used the World War II soldier as a model because they were thought to be the most beloved fighting figures. But two, it was also the, there was no such thing as an action figure until they created G.I. Joe. So these action figures created in 1965 are first were white. One year later, in 1966, they created the first African American. And when you think about what's going on in our country's history in 1966, for Hasbro to create a toy, an image of a black man, and equip it with the exact same stuff that the white man had, guns, boots, clothes cars, helicopters, all of these things, and to acknowledge that they were in our military fighting the enemy side by side, that was a major accomplishment. It opened up the doors like never before. So it did things to help push the civil rights movement and civil rights agenda beyond race and even start talking about gender. And we start talking about masculinity and what are, you know, do real men play with dolls or action figures? Would you buy your son one? So, so it opens up a whole big discussion. The history that it documents, though, is Black military presence in every military conflict that this country has been involved in up until present day. What most people don't realize is that our government, when we're at war, they ask the toy industry and the film industry to produce films that support the war effort. So if they were only producing white action figures, then that would negate the fact that black, brown, and other people of color are contributing their lives to these war efforts. So I'm glad that this, this G.I. Joe display, I have over 100 of the big ones, the 12 inch ones, the kind you used to play for that you could throw off a building and they would just fall and then you'd get them back up and you could keep playing with them. I have over 100 of those that document everything from the Tuskegee Airmen all the way up to Colin Powell, to the Afghan conflict and the warriors that are in those, and in every branch of service, not just military, but the police, the fire department. So I have action figures that depict what this life is like of these soldiers and tells true stories. And I bring those out. It takes, uh, oh shoot, if I bring the whole display, you're gonna need about eight tables, and we can set it up as a passive display where people can come by and look at it and I can just engage them, or we can do a formal presentation with the slideshow and the display. It's a very powerful thing, particularly if you've got young folks, or actually uh, some of the most powerful things I've had is I've had the privilege of taking it to military bases. I've had grown soldiers come by and cry because they've looked at the, there's a section of a, a GI Joe uh, Vietnam Wall Memorial. And when they see that, they've got friends that they lost in Vietnam and they cry and they look at it and they say, oh my God, and again, I get people, oh, I never knew they even made Black G.I. Joes. I definitely didn't know they had this many G.I. Joes. So, so yeah, that's still a place for it, man. I mean, there, and there's some history to it. Uh, it's a positive story. It's a feel-good story. And it's the most powerful and subtle diversity lesson you can ever have. People walk by. I don't care whether you are a, a, a kid in third grade, the cafeteria worker, or the president of the university or the, or the principal of the school. Everyone has some type of connection, memory, or relationship to G.I. Joe. So it's, it's a real good good display, man. I mean, so I'm looking forward to it. You and I can partner. You know me, man. You have been one of my biggest supporters ever since I got started in this. So definitely we'll 
We'd love to work with you and keep yeah, this going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, I'm going to uh, on air say WPC is uh, definitely over the next 10 years willing to have that continue to be a part of our exhibit area. All right. Uh, presentations, but also I think uh, we need to think about how to collaborate to maybe reach out to Hasbro and other organizations to give more yes. people this opportunity because I think if you got a kind of exhibit that can bring anybody from all aspect of the building of the organization of the community then in addition to pushing and challenging folks we also want to be able to provide opportunities to find some commonality yeah. that's genuine that's genuine yes. and and that's uh, right. and uh, yeah so um uh, uh, listen i we can keep yeah. talking for another half hour, but we don't yeah. have that time. But I, I, I want to end with something that I know I can get from you. What you gonna and get that me? is um, suggestions to watch on TV, streaming. I feel like this is a oh. confinement quarantine time. So I'm wondering, what have you watched that you've learned from? Uh, so, anything you've watched that you've learned from, but also anything you've watched that just kind of takes you away that you enjoy. Uh, we're trying to create a little uh, right. a database for people to share in reference to what they're watching. The thing that I, the, the thing that I watched and I want everyone, I don't care what color, what gender, what orientation you are, you need to watch the six part episode, Who Killed Malcolm X? That piece will tell you a lot about black people, the United States of America, but more importantly, it'll tell you a lot about Malcolm and the community in which he was in, the circumstances in which he was uh, dealing with. All of the, when you, you think about a man who walked out of his house every day saying the kind of things that he said, knowing that black and white people were uncomfortable and wanted him dead yet he still said them. You think about the things that it cost him and his family. So this is a powerful documentary if you, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about it. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go back and watch it again. I watched it twice now, and I'm gonna watch it again. Because I think Malcolm is, is a underappreciated gem in the United States of America. And so I think you should watch that. Now, to escape, well, not even to escape, but here's the thing, I, you know, there's a couple of different genres of television I like. I am an action guy. I loved to watch the show 24. I like James Bond. I like all those action folks. But there's a picture on Netflix that comes from African Netflix. It's called Queen Sono. If you're not watching Queen Sono and you still run around here watching James Bond and 24 and Jack Reacher and all those, and you're black, then that's a problem. And if you're a woman and you, you care about gender equity, then you ought to be supporting Queen Sono because the sister is bad and the, the writing's good, the plot's good, storyline's good. Watch that series. I don't want to see that one canceled, so y'all need to watch that one. So that's what I watched to escape. Um, and if there's a it's got black characters in it. I've probably watched it just because I'm interested. Here's, here's one of the things that I'm going to put out there. And this going to, can I leave you on a controversial note, Brother E? Oh, I would expect nothing less. I am arguing that there is not a positive portrayal of a black man, or there hasn't been one, on television or in film since. The Cosby Show mm. and Bill Cosby. Mm. And now people you are free to disagree and you want to debate me, that's fine. I'll be on social media so we can have that conversation. But I am articulating that there is nothing out there that presents a black man the way that the Cosby Show has. And it hasn't been. And you can name you name a movie you think of black man. Well, wait, 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 wait. The black man is. Give me the movie. I know you got one. Yeah, well, I, I would say Just Mercy as a as a recent. Just Mercy. Yeah, but it don't look it, it don't end well for the whole time in the movie. <laughs> so that would be my that would just be but, out of the sky first positive. You so, know. so he he's a positive person, right? I give you that. Brian Steve, he's positive, but it's it's intertwined with this story, a tragic story, 
of a black man being put on death row. So you, you, no, you can't I, get one without that. No, no. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to push back immediately. I got to give some reflection to that. I got to do some homework. Give some reflection. I, I, I'm going to tell I, you the ones that people have been hitting me with. Uh, blackish. And let me let me put it in perspective for because I know I get that one a lot. Blackish, blackish, blackish. Blackish is a good show. But let me ask this question. Who did Dr. Cliff Huxtable work for? And who does Mr. Blackish work for? Yeah. Yeah. I, I so mean, they ain't on they're not on par. You've always been a front of the check kind of guy, and I appreciate that about you. And Thank you, um uh, and, and you've always been a great role model and inspiration to go out on your own. Because when I met you, I always had a gig and I was doing some gigs on the side. And yeah. you uh, uh, have always been a great example of how you can do this on your own, man. And I appreciate that, bro. And, and I'm going to support you to the end. And, hey, and I, I'm so glad that you stepped away and, and have been doing what you've been doing on your own. Because the reality is, the world needs more people like you. And when you were doing it, you know, kind of part time, the world was worse off than it is now that you've been doing it full time. So you, you stay the course, brother. I mean, I know this virus has us all at home, but you've been doing good work. The, the White Privilege Conference is, is you know, fabulous. I mean, it, it is the epitome of, of, of a black owned experience. And so you've done that well. And now that you're doing the consulting that goes along with it and taking it and doing the regionals, man, you know, I, I, I got you. As long as you're doing it, you got a space for me. I got a space for you. Much love and respect. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me to have this coffee. I didn't bring my coffee mug. I had to hear <laughs> it. I should have brought my coffee mug. So Next time, next time, next time. Got you. All right, bro, man. Well, you be safe, man. Take care. We'll see each other. We'll be in touch with each other. And we appreciate you joining us today. Frank, no, thank you. Peace. Peace. Peace.